Sound speed. Marker. Action. Check, check. Check one, two. Son of a Sound speed. Action. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for another True Audio Presents. My name is Thomas Pop. I'm the marketing director here at True. And today, we have a different type of seminar for you guys. We're talking about the FCC today, the Federal Communications Commission. And what they basically do, I'm going to show you a quick burst of this. They deal with this graph, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But in order to do that, I need to bring in my guest today. Bill Ruck, how are you doing today, sir? I'm having too much fun. Oh, well, that's good. Well, we've already only started, so yeah. there's a lot to happen. And the reason why I brought Bill in today, everyone, is that he is uh, tied up with IATSE 695, the union, and is kind of helping to spearhead the project on obtaining an FCC license. So, Bill, I guess the first thing to start with, well, I, I think we should start off with who you are and why you're here and why I chose you to break down this seminar. Okay. Um, yeah, just as general background, um, I've been a broadcast engineer for a very, very long time. And the neat thing about broadcast engineering is that you have to have broad skills, audio, RF, and uh, today, inter, uh, IP and everything else. And and so I've kind of built this whole thing uh, of, of background. And I've also been active with the Society of Broadcast Engineers. I'm the chair of the Northern California Frequency Coordinating Committee. So I'm very active in broadcasting and frequency coordination and how you use things. And I realized a long time ago that, gee, wireless microphones are getting, or there's been a problem here and people are not licensed. And so I've been advocating uh, now for 20, 30 years, you need to get a license. And then I happened through mutual friends, Dr. Jay Patterson at Local 695, and I've been working with them to build their website on how you get a license and why you need to get a license. Well, you know what? I mean, I think we should really start right there. I, I've been in the industry for a long time, about 15, 20 years now, and I don't have a license. I'm sorry. Why, why do I need to get a license? Why is that important? And why are we going to be working on getting me one and uh, making sure that I'm kosher with the FCC? Well, um, the, the simple answer is, number one, it's required. That's a pretty good answer. <laughs> That's okay. a pretty good answer, even though it's not been, uh, even though people get away with it. Number two is that if you have a license, you uh, can, can, uh, you can trump someone without a license because your license has high, higher priority. So if there's a situation with uh, interference and mutual problems, having a license allows you to trump them. Uh, with white space devices, you could actually shut off white space devices while you're working, although white space devices never really happen. But the main reason why you need to have a license is that the FCC has something called standing. If you don't have a license, you don't have standing before the FCC. And as they're reallocating spectrum right, left, and sideways, without a license, you're not counted. And that is part of the reason why wireless mics have gotten so little respect from the FCC is that not enough people, uh, I'm probably less than 1% of the users, actually hold the license. Wow. And in fact, you were telling me a couple statistics recently about, you know, the, the people that are trying to, you know, influence the FCC and let them know, hey, you know, we, we need help. Don't just sell off our frequencies to, to other people that have tons and tons and tons of money. You're going to lose all of your ability to do wireless entertainment and things like that. Um, I mean, what, what can you say about that? Like you, you were bringing up the NFL. Can you tell well, me a little bit more about that? The, the NFL is a, an interesting organization, and they realized a long time ago that they needed a lot of RF links to do a football game. And so a regular football game has got something like 50 frequencies in play, and the Super Bowl has thousands. It, it's it completely bonkers. And they've been very active in uh, putting together frequency coordination and, and licensing and taking sure everything is on the up and up. They're very squeaky clean about things. So the... Uh, 
the NFL went to the FTC and its whole reorganization thing and pointed out, and the FTC said, oh, that's nice. And that was it. Uh, they really didn't care that the NFL is a, <laughs> a fairly large organization and they needed all these frequencies. God, what are they, badminton fans? What's going on here? I, 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 I um, yeah, I'll be nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in fact, one of the other interesting artifacts of this whole rearrangement of the UHF TV band is that the most proactive groups were Christian churches. Because a typical modern church uses 20, 30, 40 wireless mics and inner monitors and a whole bunch of other stuff. And they kind of went, ooh, we can't afford to rearrange everything. And and they've, of course, been operating with a license as well. But uh, they were able to put enough pressure on Congress to at least get the FCC to acknowledge maybe we should think a little bit about wireless mics. Wow, little, that's very like, interesting. That much. So it, it basically comes down to the more people that band together, the more we're going to have a voice, the more we're going to have that special clout, because if not, we're just we're just not important. I don't want to say that, but is that... Well, there's... And, and let me back up a little bit. Sure. And just give you an idea of of why we have an FCC and 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 the overall history of, of radio. Yeah, what is you know, the FCC? Do you mind? What is the FCC? Oh, yeah. Well, um, in 19... 19- Hundred when Marconi was getting started with wireless communications, uh, there was a beginning to have a lot of interference. And some of it was accidental because the equipment was not sophisticated by today's standards, but also some of it was deliberate interference between the various people that were trying to do wireless. And so by international agreement, all of the countries in the world have said, you're going to manage the FC, the your free radio frequencies. And uh, in the United States, after some other stumbles. In 1934, the Communications Act in 1934 established the FCC, which regulates all non-federal use of radio frequencies in the United States. Everything that they do, uh, everything we do is regulated by the FCC, except for the federal government. But in what used to be uh, a 10 pages of rules uh, in the 1935 uh, now is about four or five feet of binders full of arcane regulations for every aspect of radio frequency use in the United States. Incredible. And if anybody wants to see what that kind of, uh, I, you use the word gobbledygook. That's a very technical term if you guys have never heard of it. Um, this is part 90. It says assignment and use of frequencies in the bands allocated for federal use. B, the following frequencies are available for wireless microphone operations to eligibles in this part, subject to the provisions of this paragraph. One, on center frequencies, 169.575 megahertz, 170.025 megahertz, 175.075. What am I talking about right now, Bill? This is, this is some different type of code to me. Yeah, well, um, uh, fortunately, uh, a very good friend of mine is both a registered professional engineer and a lawyer and also retired from the FCC. And, and, and my friend Phil uh, tells me, the big print giveth and the fine print taketh away. <laughs> and that is true in every part of the FCC. So they've organized this whole, uh, all of the regulations into various parts that each part is uh, uh, re- dedicated to a certain kind of user. And part 90 is public safety and in- industry and business and basically land mobile radio. Part 74 is broadcast auxiliary services, uh, which is kind of a, a, a sidecar of Part 73, which is broadcast AM, FM, TV uh, kind of licenses. So every when we talk about part this and part that, part 101 is microwave and et cetera, part 22 are cell phones. Those are that's the part of the federal rules for that particular kind of use. So part 90 is one category where there's wireless microphones are mentioned. And then part 74 is another category uh, of how that happens. Okay, so that's good. So we don't need to know all the numbers. You only need to know the numbers that pertain to the gear and the frequencies that we handle and we deal with. That's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> regulatory hell is my life these days. I I do a lot of work in public safety communications, and I'm always trying to figure out how to make things work and the various rules that you can and can't have. But the the, the thing is that uh, and, and the slide you showed earlier of, uh, of all the frequencies, there are no unused frequencies in the United States and most uh, rest of the world. Uh, there's no blank spaces on, that, on the, that chart we've got here. 
And so as new things came along and in the United States, the, the, the big dog right now are, are cellular phones and wireless communication, things like that. Mm -hmm. They needed a place to land. And so the, historically, um, that has to come from somebody else because, again, there's no blanks. So originally in 1950-something, when the UHF TV ban was made available, um, and it's a, another backing up a little bit, but during World War II, the military got everything. And then when the war was over, they gradually relinquished blocks of frequencies to the public. And that's where low band television channels two through six and high band television seven through 14 came around. Uh, that's also how FM moved from low band to 88 to 108 as after they rearranged things after the war. And then in the mid fifties, the UHF TV ban was made available. And that originally had channels um, 14 through channel 83, well up in the 800 megahertz band. Tuners uh, of early first generation UHF tuners were terrible. And as a result, TV stations were allowed to have megawatts of power, which meant for very expensive power bills. And they also had to spread the channels far apart so that they wouldn't get interference. And so there was a lot of unused spectrum in the UHF band uh, up until the 70s. And so when cell phones came around, they said, we need more spectrum. And so the FCC kind of went, oh, well, okay, we'll give you 800 megahertz. The 800 megahertz chunk of the UHF TV band moved a couple of TV stations out of that. And that became cell phones with a tiny slice for public safety and land mobile communications. And that original cell phones came out of the UHF TV band, 800 megahertz. Uh, cell phones, as we all know, took off. And then everybody, they wanted more, they wanted more, they wanted more. And so the FCC... Uh, was under a lot of pressure to do something. And about the same time, the, the TV band, when the TV people wanted to change from analog television, known as NTSC, to digital television, which is called ATSC. And they couldn't figure out how they could do the conversion. And so the FCC said, well, okay, we'll let you have two channels for your single TV station. Uh, but when it's done, you're going to lose 700 megahertz. And so the TV people said, okay, fine. And so we converted to ATSC. And then the 700 megahertz band was taken away from broadcasting and became mostly cell phones with a little tiny slice for public safety. Wow. So they're literally just like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Okay, well, you're changing it. So we're going to use this and give it to these people now. And the, it just, it just keeps no going. There are no blanks in, on that chart. Wow. Okay. It, it kind of reminds me of like Costco on a Sunday when you just don't want to be there. There's just too many people in there. Look at that, everybody. That is congestion. No, no. It, you want to be real, real careful to stay away from the uh, toilet paper and paper towels. <laughs> Absolutely. So anyway, and but the uh, the cellular wireless world wanted more, wanted more, wanted more, and so they went to Congress, and Congress passed a law saying the FCC will auction off the 600 megahertz band, and so the FCC said, okay, when the Congress says you do that, you have to do it, and so they auctioned off the 600 megahertz band, repacking all the TV stations. And, and made more spectrum available for cell phones. Aye. And and that also made all of those empty white spaces go away. And so as a result, there's less and less spectrum available uh, for use by broadcast auxiliary part 74, subpart H, low power auxiliary stations. That's where wireless microphones are, are in the UHF TV band are licensed. So, um, so can you use that equipment? Like if you've got some older transmitters that are above that 608 megahertz, what, what, what can you do with them? My father used to tell his children, yes, you can. And no, you may not. <laughs> yeah. This is a doorstop now, right? Yeah. Well, the, the, uh, the other part of this whole background, and this is, uh, because I live in lots of worlds and I, I just enjoy being a generalist that the FCC requires cell phone carriers to locate 911 calls even without a GPS receiver. And so they have built into their systems required by the FCC radio direction finding abilities. Wow. So if you're operating on one of the 600 or 700 megahertz frequencies, uh, um, with your old equipment, because that's you, you know, it's, it's money to buy new ones. Um, if they find a, a what's called a foreign carrier, uh, and they have somebody in your neighborhood, you will get a visit from the cell companies. Wow. And the cell companies don't have to go to the FCC. I mean, they could, but the FCC's enforcement is is underpaid and uh, understaffed. They have lawyers, and so you can find yourself subject to a lawsuit for staggering amounts of money. Uh, from the cell companies that are protecting 
uh, their own spectrum. I mean, they paid a lot of money for their 700 and 600 megahertz spectrum. So what happens? You work with that one. And if you get caught, um, you're going to be uh, uh, subject to a lawsuit. And if nothing else, have a, pay a lawyer to defend you. And ultimately, you could be in trouble. There are legendary stories. I don't know them personally, but I've heard them on and off again of uh, cell companies driving around on Sundays, knocking on doors of churches saying, uh, excuse us, but you can't use those wireless microphones. Wow. Sorry, Jesus. <laughs> Turn it off. Well, it, it, you know, if, if you just paid hundreds of millions of dollars for Spectrum, you're going to protect it. Yeah, and that's, for that's sure. the bottom line here. For sure. So yes, you can, but I don't recommend it. So do I need a license? Yes. You do. Yes. If you're in this industry, if you want to consider yourself a professional, you need to get a license. You need to protect your uh, your ability to transmit the stuff that you're legally allowed to purchase. You're legally allowed to purchase it, but you're not legally allowed to transmit it unless if you have the licenses. Yeah. Um, wow. The, the, the FCC is, is an enforcement bureau, which is the people that knock on doors, is severely underfunded and they're severely uh, uh, understaffed. And so if it's the president, if it's the FAA, and if it's public safety, they're fairly responsive to that. And I, I work with the local FCC with interference cases regularly. But commercial users will get to you maybe one of these days. So um, uh, the fact that the FCC is not going to be looking for 250 milliwatt transmitters, they just, they just don't have the resources to do that. Yeah. So you can get away with uh, doing this, uh, although, and that's what people have been doing for 20 or 30 or 40 years is the operating with a license. But as I said before, without a license, you don't have standing and you won't be counted whenever they're reallocating spectrum. So that is the, the bottom line is having a license protects your use of the radio frequency spectrum. And uh, if that's how you make money, I think that's important. So, Bill, uh, answer me another question. When it comes to the FCC and filling out this application, is there like a consensus that happens like every few years that it's like, oh, okay, now there's 100,000 sound mixers that have the FCC instead of three? The, uh, the, the issue is if you have a license, the FCC has to acknowledge that. If you don't have a license, they don't care. So the more people that have licenses – the more that whenever the FCC wants to do any rulemaking, they have to count the number of people of that particular category of license and say, oh, well, we have 800,000 people licensed that way. Maybe we need to think about it. And one of the other very important issues is that you guys, you know, the sound production sound people, is one silo, which doesn't quite understand the other silo, which could be Broadway musicals that literally will use 100 wireless mics. Or rock and roll bands and that have wireless mics on stage, or churches that have 20 or 30 wireless things, or any other institutions use wireless mics. They're all individual silos, all of which need to get involved and they need to get licensed because the more people that have an, a wireless, a low power broadcast auxiliary license, the more the FCC is going to have to say, well, we need to consider all these people if we're going to give away more spectrum. You know, That's I really like how you. Numbers. I like how you mentioned that because it, it does come down to the fact of how you were talking earlier. Like, you know, we're part of that 90 and part of that 74. And there's clearly like, how many numbers are there? Are there like 200 or something like that? No, of people? Uh, no, you know, like of oh. the parts inside of this FCC that oh, they deal it, with. Um, there's about 100. Okay, so there's about 100. And, you know, maybe we're only dealing with two. But I remember you saying, like, in the beginning, there were only 10 parts, and now it's this huge reference because, like you said, they have to classify people. So if we're only classified as a person who uses a wireless system instead of truly classifying ourselves as, no, we're production sound mixers working on entertainment or we're working on music venues and concerts or we're working at a church, you know, all of these different classifications need to be known about so they know you know, the demographic of who's using this equipment. I think that's that that's important, and that's why I'm happy to work with you and Local 695 to get the word out, um, because every single new license is one more that gets counted. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You know, I, I can't solve all the problems of, of the entire world, but in the broadcast world and with all of my friends in the, uh, the audio production world, um, I can talk to you, and, and we're all buddies. Absolutely. Let's 
bounce into a little bit more of the education. You were talking to me a little earlier about Iraq, and what I wanted to do yeah. is know a little bit about the differences between the two. Yeah, this is a, a extremely obscure part of regulations in the radio frequency world. The Federal Communications Commission regulates the use of frequencies by everybody except the federal government. The federal government has their own organization called IRAC, which is the Interagency Radio Advisory Committee. And so when if you look under part two of the rules, there are charts that shows how everything is broken down by frequency and who gets to use what and everything else. Uh, and, and there's federal and non-federal columns there. If it's only federal, it's no big deal, military or whatever. If it's shared use, it gets messy because you'll apply to the FCC for a license for the shared use. And then the FCC has to coordinate that with IRAC. And IRAC may or may not say yes or no. And they may or may not ever tell you why. So shared frequencies are, are kind of a problem when you share between the federal government and non-users. So, And IRAC literally is so secret that people in the FCC cannot see that database. Wow. I mean, so the IRAC, is it using UHF? Like, do we have to be worried about IRAC? Are they around us? Is that another well, conspiracy? If, 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 if you want to apply for the Part 90.265 VHF frequencies, known as the hydrological band, you do because that is a federal frequency which they're sharing. Interesting. The, the broadcast frequencies are not shared. And as a result, um, we don't have to worry about IRAC. There are some obscure ones that are shared. Uh, and then we get into the uh, consumer versus military things uh, where the military uh, uses bands of frequencies that uh, overlap that. Um, and as an ex example, many years ago, all of a sudden, all of the garage door openers didn't work in Contra Costa County. And that was because the Navy put a transmitter up in the same frequency band to link to a ship that had a problem with their equipment and <laughs> it was the same frequencies and so wireless uh, garage door openers didn't work and that's because it's a shared band and the feds have priority it was just jamming all the garage doors so nobody could get their cars out yeah unreal yeah. so uh, i can i can go on for days on stories of 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 frequency sharing and interference and, and problems like that it is a real issue uh uh when you have unknown and 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 things like federal stuff that is secret and and you can't talk about it. Wow, very good. Well, I do know that we have a couple more questions before we go. Okay. One of the biggest ones is, you know, what is the duplex gap? Well, um the duplex in, in the process of sorting things out with the 600 megahertz uh thing, uh there's a graphic that I just sent you. Oh, I I I'm still pulling it in, so stand by, okay, it'll come. Okay. Um we can edit out that comment, but uh, the problem is the TV channels are six are, are six megahertz wide. So every six megahertz is another TV channel. But the cell companies wanted five megahertz wide channels, and they needed to separate the uplink, which is your portable device, to them, as well as the downlink, which is their transmitters going back out to your device. And so they ended up with, and that's the duplex gap. And the other messy part of the 600 megahertz whole uh, issue was that the uh, uh, they also had a tap dance around uh, something called channel 37, which is dedicated to uh, 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 astronomical research. And worldwide, they've agreed that the frequencies around what we call channel 37 cannot be transmitted on because they have super, super sensitive receivers trying to listen to things you know, somewhere out in space. So when they rearranged things, they not only had to deal with the TV band, they had to deal with converting six megahertz channels to five megahertz channels as duplex and everything else. So that's why the post auction TV wireless band is so messy because they had to figure out how to squeeze everything in. Incredible. So that's what the duplex gap is. So it's so basically what part of the duplex gap is licensed use only then? Well, the, um, um, I need my cheat sheet here. The 614 to 616 is unlicensed, and then 653 to 657 is licensed. Okay. And and there's some other kinds of stuff that goes into that, but 
uh, they did everything, and there's some buffers where nobody can have anything, and uh, it's it is uh, a classic uh, a compromise, uh, cutting the baby precisely in half, trying to squeeze everything they could into the TV van. Crazy man, they're yeah, they're they're pushing a lot in there. Is this is this kind of stuff? Does this need to make sound mixers stay up at night and lose sleep? <laughs> yes. Um, Sorry, guys. I asked the real questions. Well, that that no, that is is a problem because on one hand, the industry has moved towards more and more wireless because it's fast and easy, and and meets the current needs of of today's production. But on the other hand, there's never been a dedicated wireless microphone band. And as a result, you've just been camping out in the UHF TV band. Uh, and because you don't get counted, it's been squeezed out. Explaining that to a producer is going to be entertaining. Yeah. Uh, um, they don't want to hear about that. They all want to know better, faster, cheaper. Yep. Yeah. If they, if they don't understand it. And, you know, when they're going through their education life, they don't really get that type of depth of knowledge in other departments. So it's just kind of lost out there in the world. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, I don't want to beat up on producers, but um, I've had my go arounds with them when I've, when I've done production audio and things. And, and, and there are some great people out there that understand that and will work with you. And there are some people out there that I choose not to ever work for them again. Yeah. But, you know, one of the good things about obtaining an FCC license is it's going to give you the tools and, and the confidence that you know that you're working professionally, that you're working correctly, that you're not going to have somebody show up at your production's doorstep saying, uh, excuse me, turn that off right now, yeah. right now, or I'm calling the police. You don't want to have a problem like that. So we need to make sure that we're getting our licenses and, and putting all of our ducks in a row. Uh, Bill, how much does this license cost for anybody that's like, God, is this like a $5,000 thing I've got to pay for after I buy my wireless? No, it, uh, the filing fee is $170 presently. Okay. And is it something that you have to, uh, you know, renew, uh, you know, every year or something like that? Or Well, it, this is a complicated answer. Uh, licenses are in, in the Part 74 world are a 10-year license. Okay, Part 74 is, is 10 years. Yeah. The catch is that all the Part 74 licenses expire at the same time as Part 73 licenses. And that varies across the United States. And they've staggered it so that different parts of the, of the United States, everybody renews in 2013 or 2014 or 2021 or 22. So depending on where you are in that cycle, you'll be granted a license that would, may not be for the full 10 years because – the expiration date in California is this year. And, and so you'll get a two or three or whatever your license. And then when you renew it, you get full 10 years. Gotcha. So it's just, it's based on the brackets of when they do it. So get on, get it, and then renew at that when that bracket ends. There, there's a couple of very important things uh, uh, is that when you get a license uh, and, and it's true of any license, whether it's, public safety or amateur or whatever, uh, you need to pay attention to that because when the license expires, uh, you basically lose that and you have to start all over again. So it's very important with the FCC is moving away from sending out paper is that your, especially your email, but everything else is kept current. So if you move and rearrange things, you're going to have to go online and do an administrative update to make sure that your information is correct. So you get a renewal and you can renew without having your license get canceled. Gotcha. Don't want to have that license canceled. Want to just keep it going. Set those reminders on your phone and be like, get this done like a couple months early so they have time to process it. Well, uh, um, you're only allowed to renew a license 90 days before the expiration. So you can't do it okay. any earlier than 90 days. Okay. Uh, and it's best to do it before the expiration. You have a 30-day grace period. After that, there are no options. Fill it out again, right? Yeah. Very Start good. from scratch. Very good. And it just, do they get deleted from the database or, you know, it's just, yeah, well, just whatever happens up, on their end happens. It, it just shows up as expired in the database. Gotcha. Very good. Yeah, you don't want to do that. How no, do you pay no. this fee? Is this something that you just do on their website? Um, I will be kind and say that the FCC's Universal Licensing System, uh, ULS website, is the world's most user-unfriendly website 
you could ever want to have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I routinely tell people that Amazon would not tolerate a website this bad. Yeah. But uh, when you when you do it all the time, like I do, I I know it's quirks, but it can be frustrating. And uh, the other problem is, I uh, this weekend I was corresponding with a guy that couldn't renew his license because the website was crashed for two days. Oh, there you go. Wow. So, uh, but anyway, it came back to life. He renewed his license. And, and that's why good. you got to do it early. So, you know, if you know that you've got that 90-day window, again, set that timer so you can start just in case yep. that there is a problem. There's a ton of people doing it too. Well, uh, like most people, I put off doing paperwork until, you know, the 3 a.m. the night before the uh, term papers do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure. You know, I got another question before we go and, and tell people how and where they can go to fill out this information. I did want to talk about ComTech transmitters, 216 megahertz. What's the story uh, with this? That is a can of worms. Yeah? Because that is a different part of the rules, and the 216 megahertz frequencies are available only for assisted uh, li uh, uh assisted use. So if you're dealing with uh, people that can't hear and other kinds of things, that would be the band you use. It is not legal to use it for production audio. Copy that. If everybody heard it so, here. Y yes, you can, but no, you may not. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I can actually read you cause I get asked this question a lot. Uh, pause for a moment while I'm looking up something here, but on my computer. You're fine. Uh, so, so this is something that uh, that they actively know about. So, I mean, that means like if people are using contacts, that maybe they should start phasing them out because it's not it's not wise to do that and put the risk on your production. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where I I, I, I get asked this question regularly, and so as a result. Um, well, while you're looking for it, um, one of the things that I can do is uh, to show some time. You guys have a beautiful website uh, landing page at IATSE Local 695 for the FCC licensing. I believe that this website was made by uh, a combination of you, Jay Patterson, and Lawrence Abrams from 695 to, uh, well, I mean, I guess both of them are from 695, uh, that just breaks down everything perfectly. It's a very beautiful, clean website. It has a lot of the questions that we went over today. So if you guys want to take a look and support the website and, you know, get some written answers, you can as well. And then it obviously gives you the ability to, you know, physically get the license. There's a step-by-step -step application guide. And then it tells you, hey, you can pay a professional or you can do it yourself. And that's what we have for you as well. We have two different ways for you to file for your FCC license. If you want to, Bill Ruck is available. And we created an email address, FCCHelp at TrueAudio.com. If you email me, I'm going to pass it through to Paul and make sure that he's able to help you. And, you know, just say hello along the way. Yeah. And if not... I you can do it yourself with this step-by-step -step guide. That QR code will take you directly to the website or it's local695.com slash FCC dash licensing. Um, you know, those things will basically help you to get started on your journey. Yeah. Bill, how are you feeling? I, I'm, I'm having a great time and, and I'm, I'm doing my best here to, to promote the use of wireless microphones. And I, and I, I will say I have nothing but praise for 695 because they've been proactive for many, many years. They brought me down to LA, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago uh, when we did an afternoon seminar on how to do that. And if you're patient and can deal with arcane bureaucratic kind of stuff, you can walk through the website. The instructions are fairly obvious, uh, but you have to have patience. And, and so uh, that is an option available to everybody. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, IATSE nationwide has been pointing towards that website, trying to get people to do that. But if you get frustrated and run into problems, you can get a hold of me through uh, through audio, and uh, uh, I will I can happily take care of it for you. I, I charge a hundred dollars for the for doing the paperwork for you and holding hands and getting everything right. And it's uh, another option for you. There are a couple other people in the United States that do this. You know, one of the things I remember you telling me before we started this uh, live stream today is that if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to end up sending it in, and then they're going to kick it back to you, and you're going to have to fix something, and then you're going to have to send it in, they're going to kick it back to you, and you're going to have to fix it, and you're just going to do that. Or you can just contact Bill, and he's going to help you, and you're going to pay him because it's incredible advice that's going to save you so much 
time. You're going to get it done. You're going to be able to put your title underneath your name like everybody does in their social media. You're going to feel so cool, so important, right? Yeah, you could have you could have a WQPE 527 after your name. That's, man, I want that. I for okay. sure do. Now I'm teasing. But, Mo, but, but for real, w- with all the joking aside, guys, titles and everything aside, it is something that we all need to do. We all have to collectively help the cause. And by, by registering and letting the government know, letting the FCC know who we are and what we're using, it's, it's just going to help us in the long run. It can't hurt us. It, it can hurt us if we don't do it. My understanding is that a couple of the lots in Los Angeles now – require you to have a license to use wireless mics on their property. I believe that's correct. I'm not going to name them right now because I don't know them off the top of my head, but I, I believe that you're correct. It's it's becoming more of a serious matter. People don't want to play games anymore. It's not worth it. Yeah. No, and and it's a, um, in a regulatory world, we, we got to take care of ourselves. Um, and I'm on a daily basis, I get calls from uh, uh, broadcasting people trying, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, as well as public safety and, and other Part 90 users. And it's just a matter of understanding the rules and, and trying to, to do your best to make sure that you're, you're squeaky clean and, and, and licensed. And uh, the, that gives you the privileges of, of using the radio frequency spectrum. Now, um, the duplex gap thing, if we can come back to that, Mm-hmm. As part of this whole storm and drong over at 600 megahertz, the FCC generously donated 614 to 616 megahertz, uh, 2 megahertz of spectrum, uh, towards unlicensed microphones. And in fact, they've reinterpreted the rules saying you cannot even hold a license in the 614 to 616 megahertz band, even though they granted licenses for about a year before they changed their mind. So that is available to anybody to do anything they want to do. Um, and But at the rest of the band are require a license. Hmm. So there is a unlicensed spectrum now available. The FCC patted themselves on the back, offering other spectrum available uh, with too many uh, complications, none of which would be applicable to you in the 1.4 and 3 and other, other bands. Those are... Um, really only available for a fixed location. So that's really not too useful to you guys. Uh, But the networks use them a lot when they're, you know, uh, like uh, golf and sports and uh, uh, the uh, car races. You know, I routinely coordinate stuff uh, for golf and NFL and, uh, you know, baseball, basketball. They're not that too big. But uh, Sears Point Raceway has got, you wouldn't believe the amount of frequencies they use for audio and video to have in-car cameras and all the other stuff they do. It's unreal. So there's th- these are all part of trying to make it work. One of the interesting things, that if you look under Part 74.803C, which lists uh, various frequencies in the 900 megahertz band, the problem here is that some of that is shared with the feds and some of that is not. 944 to 952 megahertz is broadcast studio to transmitter links, and that is only broadcast, and that that we can license on a nationwide basis, uh, which is what you need for production audio. But the other parts of the 900 megahertz band, 941.5 to 944, and 952.85 and up, um, those are shared with Part 101 and the federal government, and this is another one of those gotchas. Iraq will not coordinate nationwide on a shared frequency. So uh, when I do license for people that wander around, which is exactly what production audio does, I only put in 944 to 952 because that'll get approved. Mm -hmm. The other bands are available, but only if you want to do it at a fixed location. So if you're a Broadway theater on whatever, you know, whatever address that theater is, you can license those other bands, but, that's a fixed location, and Iraq will coordinate with that. They won't coordinate nationwide. Crazy. God, there's a lot of stuff that happens behind the curtains that a lot of people don't think about. We're thinking we're just putting a wire on a talent, but there's a lot that goes on in the air. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, the the, um, 
there is a band uh, 1435 to 1525 megahertz available, but it's only specific locations. And that is shared with uh, federal government and aeronautical research. And there's a whole, and it's used pretty commonly in by uh, NFL and, and sports events and things like that. Um, so there's, there are other things out there, but they have so many fine print things that they wouldn't be applicable to your world. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated process to fill out everyone, but it's not, it's not too bad with, with all of the step-by-step -step applications that they have online. You can go ahead and try it yourself or again, We've got Bill standing by. Just take a look at the FCC help at trueaudio.com. You send an email that basically goes right to me, and then I pass it along to Bill for him to help you because we want to make sure that everybody gets through this as seamlessly, as quickly as possible, and they're comfortable that they understand what they're doing because it should, it should make you feel confident that you're helping the, the general masses of sound mixers in the world, and you're also helping your production, making sure that you're just one more level of protection for them. Bill, thank you so much for doing this today. I appreciate you. Again, everyone, if you need them, FCC help at trueaudio.com. We'll forward it right to Bill. This was incredible. I thank you so much for doing this. And, you know, I think we're even going to be talking later about maybe doing a course, but we'll bring that up at another time. Is that right? Yeah. I, I, the uh, the step-by-step -step stuff on the 695 website, to me, it makes perfect sense because I do it all the time. And we've uh, I know that uh, Jay and the, the guys in the local have been working with some uh, uh, experiments trying to get people to try that and you know, make sure that the instructions make sense and everything else. And we'll continue to refine that as we find problems. Uh, and, and also as the FCC rearranges things because the previous set of instructions was made obsolete when the FCC upgraded their website. And, all, <laughs> and so the instructions didn't make sense anymore. So... It's an ongoing thing, but as an active radio frequency professional, uh, I want to encourage everybody to do that, and I want to help you in any way I can get it together. As we do here at True Audio as well. That's why we've got Bill, one of the best, to help us. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for another True Audio Presents on obtaining an FCC license. Go do it. Contact Bill. If you need help, we're here for you. Thank you so much, Bill, for being here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. We'll talk soon.